and welcome to Backpacker Flip Flops. I am your host, Joanne Hendrickson. This podcast is about my travels and experiences to different cities and countries around the world. My goal is to help travelers see and engage in places in a whole new way. Please check out my website, backpackerflipflops.com, or follow me on Instagram at backpackerflipflops. Each month, this podcast supports a different charity or organization. Thanks to your support last month, a donation was made to the Boston Public Library. For the month of May, for each subscriber and five-star review received, I will be donating $1 to Feeding Heroes, whose goal is to provide meals to brave frontline heroes in the battle against COVID-19, while also supporting as many small businesses as possible. You can learn more about this initiative or make a donation to them by visiting their link on my website, backpackerflipflops.com slash giving dash back. So if you ask someone what they know about Greenland, chances are they'll say that Greenland has ice and Iceland is green, thanks to that little fact we all learned in elementary school. But there is so much more to know about Greenland. And while I was on vacation in Iceland, which for the record is indeed green, but also has some icy areas, I had the chance to go to Greenland for a day trip. That's right. Actually, an eight-hour experience. A little trivia about Greenland. It is the largest island in the world and is a territory of Denmark. About 80% of the land is covered by an ice cap and glaciers. Around 50,000 people live there and another 90,000 visit each year. Of special interest to me, since I used to live in Denmark, is that Greenland was a Danish colony until 1953, when it became a country. It attained home rule in 1979 and began a full self-government in 2009. Their government is a constitutional monarchy. The nominal head of state is the Danish queen, Droning Margrethe II. Their currency is the Danish krona, and the official languages are Greenlandic and Danish. When I was planning my first vacation to Iceland, I booked every possible excursion I could find through a company called Nordic Visitor, who I highly recommend checking out if you're going to Iceland or any of Scandinavia. They advertised a day trip to Greenland and figured this was probably my best shot at visiting the country known for its ice, and I booked the trip. This day trip is offered in conjunction with Air Iceland, which, for the record, is a different airline than Iceland Air, which most people are familiar with. The tour is eight hours long and departs from Reykjavik's domestic airport. That airport is located around a 30-minute walk or less than a 10-minute drive from downtown Reykjavik. It is a different airport than the much larger Keflavik Airport, which you most likely will arrive into Iceland from. Airport check-in starts one hour before takeoff, and the waiting room is small and is for all the flights. I bought some snacks as I heard when you get to Greenland, food options were extremely limited and it's best to bring your lunch over with you. Soon enough, myself and around 20 other passengers boarded a tiny propeller plane and began our journey. Our destination in Greenland was a town called Kulasuk, which is a little over an hour and a half flight away and is two time zones behind Reykjavik. Kulasuk is a small settlement located in a small rocky island between jagged mountains and extensive fjords. During winter, the island is attached to mainland Greenland by ice. Kulasuk has a population of 300 people, quite a few of whom are Danes. Kulasuk is home to only one of two airports along the entire eastern coast of Greenland. The island is around five miles north to south and seven miles east to west. And while Greenland may be known for its ice, Kulasuk is actually around 70 miles south of the Arctic Circle. But yes, the icebergs you'd expect to see are there. The last half hour of the flight is quite scenic, looking out at icebergs everywhere. I've heard how you can only see like 10% of an iceberg from water level, but looking from the sky, you could see just how massive icebergs really are in the water. Every angle seems to be more impressive than the last. As you descend, you see rocks and mountains and dirt and icebergs. But the one thing you don't see is any sign of civilization. That is, until our plane finally landed on a dirt runway in front of a tiny building, which is the airport. The airport was built in the 1950s by the United States government as a Cold War airport for potential use, and I wouldn't be too surprised if it hasn't changed much since then. We found our tour guide very quickly. There was no one else at the airport. We stepped outside and the weather was lovely, probably a warm 60 degree Fahrenheit and there was the right mix of sun and clouds. Our tour guide gave us information about the community and the locals while we began our walk into town, which was 45 minutes or just shy of two miles away. The tour is a walking tour. There are very few cars or trucks on the island. The locals are Inuits and are still very much a hunter-gatherer society. Fishing is the essential source of income for many families. 
There is no real running water or flushing toilets except in the hotel or in the airport. Around three-fourths of the population is unemployed. There is a very high level of alcoholism, including in preteens. This all quickly shook me. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. I've been to remote places and poor places and places that have struggled with substance abuse, but all wrapped together in this tiny isolated town on the Greenland coastal region, my mind was trying to process it all. We continued our walk down a gravel, muddy road, the one road to get into town. We could start to see some traditional Greenlandic houses painted green, red, and yellow. There are around 150 houses on the island, but only half of them are inhabited. Our tour guide said if we wanted to see some seals, we could look over at the water, so of course we looked over. And we were very surprised to see they were referring to dead seals, tied to a pier bobbing at the shore. Seal meat is the most important part of the locals' diet, as well as they use all parts of the seal in their everyday life, whether as clothing, fat for oil for heat, or bones to make tools. While from my cultural understanding, I could not fully grasp their use of seals, I could appreciate that it was part of their culture and how reliant they are on everything. And I found myself more and more trying to get into the Inuit mindset and stop looking at the town through an American filter. For families without even having running water in their homes, the icy waters act as refrigeration. The Inuits are isolated from the world for around eight months per year, and this is how they survive. There were wolf dogs all around, many chained up to houses or rocks, and while my reaction to seeing dogs was immediately wanting to pet them, I could sense that these were pretty wild dogs, even if they were around people, and I stayed clear of them. As we approached town and all the colorful houses, I saw one thing I didn't expect, even more than the dead seals in the water, and that was litter. It was everywhere. In some ways it took away from the natural landscape, but again I found I was looking at this all through an American anti-litter mindset. But surrounding all this was mountains, glaciers, and icebergs, and I found I started to look more out than down at the dirt road. And I looked at the colored houses, scattered in a random pattern off of the one road, lacking traditional garbage disposal means, and this was a sharp contrast with the natural background. I had to remind myself, this is how they live. There are not many sights to see in Kulasuk in the traditional tourist sense, but each was a learning experience. Our first stop along our walk into town was the cemetery, and this was not like one I'd ever seen before. It had small white wooden crosses arranged in a random order and plastic flowers or other little trinkets in front of them, but there were no names listed on them. The Inuits believe that when a person dies, their spirit leaves the body and is reborn in a new body. The name of the person belongs to the spirit and therefore there were no names on crosses. The name of the deceased is passed on to the unborn, not onto a tombstone. While there are no names on the graves, families know where their loved ones are buried, and the town also has a record just in case the family forgets. During the majority of the year in Kulasuk, bodies cannot be buried underground because the ground is frozen solid. The families have to wait until midsummer to bury their loved ones who passed away earlier in the year after the ground has sufficiently thawed. I found myself falling further and further into seeing the world through the eyes of an Inuit and not with my own experiences. We stopped by the museum, which is in a tiny house and is quite humble in appearance, but is very informative. It is the private collection of a husband and wife team. The founders of the museum also serve as the teachers for the children in the community. Their collection includes artifacts related to hunting, clothing, and survival in East Greenland. There were some things I'd never seen anywhere before, like clothing made of dog fur. And they explained that when dogs die, they still use their bodies as materials. It was part of their survival using the limited available resources. There were also traditional items for sale, ranging from jewelry to items made of reindeer bones and seal skin. After leaving the museum, we made our way to the Church of Cap Dan. It is a small Lutheran church constructed around 100 years ago by the crew of a Danish sailing vessel that ran aground on the nearby coast, and the church was constructed from the wood of the ship itself. The beams still have a ship feeling, and a model of the ship used to construct the church still hangs above the organ in the church. The church has elegant stained glass windows, which were donated by a German artist who visited the island in the 1970s, and his visit made such an impression on him. The interior is very colorful and feels very warm, by emotions, not actual temperature. The pews are a rich green color. The colors inside the church pull from the houses of the town, including its bright red pillars and blue walls. The candlesticks were inlaid with ivory, and the kneeling pads were covered in seal skin. While in the church, we picked up the hymn book and got to see what the Greenlandic language looks like. 
Our tour guide shared how the Bible stories were changed over time to make sense to the locals. For example, sheep are known in the local scripture as seals because the locals have never seen sheep. The church is not used much, but is well kept. The minister does not live on the island, but comes over for special events and worship services, such as weddings and funerals. If the minister is not there, the island's police officer also serves as a deacon and can lead religious services, though services have been known to be canceled if the religious leader decides to go hunting. It was finally time for lunch and we made our way to the one store on the island. It is a bit like Walmart in that it has everything, while also being a bit like your corner deli in that it is tiny. Inside you can find everything ranging from homemade pies to guns. Yes, guns. The store is stocked up with supplies from Denmark as weather permits, but in the winter the supplies will dwindle, and the save seal meat and anything else can be hunted becomes more critical for survival. The only currency accepted is the Danish krona, not the Icelandic krona which many of my group brought with them. Having brought my lunch from Iceland, I took a short walk around the town. I came across a little girl, maybe three years old, running around holding an American flag. I wish I knew her story, but got down on her level and waved, and she waved her flag excitedly back at me before heading back to her mom. I watched some other kids playing as well, toys littering the town, but to be picked up and used again and again by the local children. An older gentleman came up to me, and I recognized him from some of the videos I'd watched about the island. This man performs the drum circle, which I would be experiencing in a little while. He came over and started talking to me, but not in English. Spotting the Danish post office sign on the building behind him, I took a chance and decided to talk back in Danish, and his eyes lit up. He started talking to me in Danish very fast, and between the dialect and the speed match with it being years since I'd really spoken the language, we had a lot of difficulty having a real conversation, but we had a meaningful one, if that makes sense. His name was Anter, and he lived in Kulasuk his whole life. He told me he tried very hard to learn to speak English, and he had heard of New York but I don't think he fully grasped an understanding that New York was a city and a state in the United States. He seemed to think it was synonymous with America. I'm so used to everyone knowing New York, so I'll admit this really surprised me. But again, I had to remind myself, I was on an island that didn't even have running water, so him not being as television savvy as some other people in the world made a lot more sense. He took both my hands, thanked me for coming to the island, and then walked off in the direction to where my group would be meeting him in a few minutes. Our group slowly joins him. He carried a drum, which was made out of the stomach of a polar bear. He performed the dance on an open and flat ledge with the cold water and stunning mountains as his natural backdrop. He pointed to a statue of a woman, and our tour guide translated, explaining that it was a statue of his mother. He then proceeded to do his performance. Here is a part of it. He performed for around 10 minutes, and while I could tell there was a chorus, there was other parts with which his body was moving from the ground up to a standing position, moving his arms slowly until he eventually was touching his shoulders, mouth, and finally above his head. Occasionally he would make animalistic noises. I had no idea what I was witnessing or hearing, and it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. When he concluded, he told us the story we had just watched, translated by our guide, who explained that it was a story about two birds falling in love and drowning, because through music and song, they teach children life's roughest lessons, that the world is not always a pleasant place. Wow. I never thought about how we teach that lesson to children, and it was interesting how this culture did it. Their society was definitely different from what I was used to. And I thought about this isolated culture and the way they teach kids about the world. It is done through a filter that makes most sense to them and their isolation and their survival. It was hard to think it was time to start heading back to the airport, but we did not walk back. We climbed down the slippery rocks by where we had watched the performance, down to the water where there were small boats to take a few people per boat through the glacial waters back to the airport. Wow, greatest ride to an airport ever. It was colder on the water, but not as cold as you would expect glacial waters to be. Each iceberg was more impressive than the next. The icebergs were just a few feet from us, and many had a rich blue color from where the water had gotten inside. 
If it wasn't for the feeling of the cool breeze, it would be so easy to think that this wasn't real. It was true nature in all of its beauty. Eventually, our boat made its way back towards land, and we had a very short walk to the airport. Our plane was still there, exactly where it had stopped earlier that morning. We made our way to the building and got a certificate marking our journey to Greenland, as well as our passport stamped. There was a tiny store, toilets with running water, and a dead polar bear hanging from the wall. My final sights of Greenland as I boarded the plane and made my journey back to Iceland. And as I sat on the plane, flying back, I looked out the window at the icebergs I had just been so close to. I started to reflect on the day. It was an eight-hour trip, but when you take out flying time, it was a four-hour experience to a very isolated community. I'll admit, the tour is not cheap. Nothing about visiting Greenland is cheap. The trip cost ranges between 450 US dollars to over 1000 US dollars, pending the day and season, for budget airfare, a walking tour, and no meals. Is it worth it? Well, if Greenland is on your bucket list, absolutely. Looking back, I loved it. I felt like I started to understand a culture unlike one I had ever experienced before. And yes, that meant seeing things like dead seals and litter and hearing a story by song about birds drowning. It was all so different. But how my mind remembers it all is my broken conversation with the drum performer and the little girl excitedly waving her American flag and just how big glaciers really are and the beautiful houses. Kulasuk wasn't always pretty, but it was real. It was a trip that changed me. It made me question how I view things in the world and I would take that over any Instagrammable tourist experience any day. On my next episode, I'll be sharing about a walking tour I took with two murderers who spent time in prison while in Belfast. Please subscribe to my podcast, Backpacker Flip Flops, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star review and tell a friend. For every subscriber or five-star review received this month, a dollar will be donated to Feeding Heroes. You can connect with me on my website, backpackerflipflops.com, or follow me on Instagram at backpackerflipflops. Pictures from this weekend are available on my Instagram page, as well as on YouTube at youtube.com slash backpackerflipflops. Thanks so much for listening. Till next time, ciao, adios, avida jane, bye.